library within the old, old library of Magdalen College. Some of what I touch on today will be published in the library, the journal of the UK Bibliographical Society. But I will also reflect on the methodology of my collections level investigation and factors which led towards the successful outcome of publishing my research. Um, I wish this was a portrait of Mary Astle that I'm showing, um, but unfortunate, unfortunately there is no known portrait in existence. This image here has been used a few times as a representation of Mary Astle. It is a frontispiece to Jacques Dubosc's book, The Excellent Woman, from 1692. We see here an unknown woman with her library collection and sitting at her desk, so we can see why this image may have been used to depict Astel. Here is the old library of Magdalen College, where the Mary Astle books form part of its collection. It is situated in the first courtyard as you enter the college, and it is the collection of books and manuscripts amassed by Magdalen since its formation as a Benedictine hostel in 1428. The college is also home to the Pepys Library, the personal library of Samuel Pepys, which came to the college in 1724. But the two libraries are treated as um, completely separate entities occupying different spaces within the college. The Pepys Library is very much a gentleman connoisseur's private library of the 17th century that is still in its original form, including the original bookcases or book presses as Pepys called them. However, the old library has been growing over a much longer period of time absorbing the book collections of many individuals associated with the college and is still being added to in the present day. In many of the old libraries of Cambridge colleges, bequests from former masters and fellows form a major part in augmenting their collections, such is the case with Magdalen. Some of the major benefactors <coughs> to the library our former masters, James Duport, a scholar of classics, <laughs> Daniel Waterland, a theologian and a bibliophile, so we will return to him later, and theologian Peter Peckard, who is known chiefly for his anti-slave trade views. Additionally, though on a smaller scale, there are many other individuals' books which have been donated or bequeathed to the old library of which Mary Astle's collection has emerged as one of the most striking. Astle was born in 1666 and was the daughter of Peter and Mary Astle, a coal merchant family from Newcastle, and so she enjoyed the material benefits of a prosperous household. Her education was relatively sophisticated, Astle's uncle Ralph, who had no children of his own, became her educator and found her to be a willing pupil. Ralph Astle was curate at the Church of St Nicholas, Newcastle, shown here. This is not quite a contemporary image. Um, it dates from the 1780s, but it does give an impression of Mary Astle's hometown. Ralph Astle immersed Mary in the teachings of the Cambridge Platonists, a group of academics at the university in the mid 17th century under whom he had studied. Then Mary Astle moved to London after a decline of the family's finances upon the death of her father, most likely around 1688, the time of the glorious revolution, which sparked riots in Newcastle. She successfully petitioned William Sancroft, the Archbishop of Canterbury, to finance her early writing career. Professor Ruth Perry, Astle's biographer, writes, whatever difficulties Astle endured when she came to London, she did not stop reading and thinking about philosophy. As an un unmarried woman attempting to establish herself as a writer, Astle positioned herself outside societal norms, but nevertheless was admitted into London's intellectual sphere, almost exclusively a male preserve. As the few other women writers of Astle's day found, Ast entry into this circle of scholars was helped enormously by an introduction from an established male. 
male-female intellectual pairings such as Damaris Masham and John Locke and Henry Moore and Lady Anne Conway were certainly a key factor in the publication of women writers' work, though Astle, unlike Masham and Conway, was unmarried, an additional hurdle to navigate in society in her pursuit of paid work as an author. Astle formed such an intellectual pairing with John Norris, philosopher and clergyman, after Astle wrote to Norris to challenge him on his published claims. Norris was so impressed with Astle's talent as a rhetorician and her lively writing style that he sought permission to publish their correspondence. While the publication, under the title Letters Concerning the Love of God, was in the planning stage, Astle published a, seri a serious proposal to the ladies in 1694, her argument for establishing communities of learning for women. Letters Concerning the Love of God appeared a year later, and the two books established her as a prominent thinker and writer. Residing in Chelsea, Astle befriended many illustrious aristocratic women, such as Lady Elizabeth Hastings and Lady Catherine Jones, who also acted as, as patrons for her writing. These women also provided financial support for Astle's project in later life, establishing and becoming the head of a charity school for girls in Chelsea in 1709. So how was Mary Astle's personal library identified and reassembled? It was an un unexpected and very pleasing outcome of the work I have been doing to make Magdalen College's old library collection more visible to academic researchers and the wider public. Due to limited online cataloguing of the collection, I wanted to produce an online resource which could be helpful to show what books were in the library. My ultimate goal is to have all of the old library's books recorded on the University of Cambridge's online library catalogue called iDiscover. However, this is a very time consuming process for the librarian. Therefore, I thought the best way of making progress would be to compile a straightforward online list of the old library's holdings so that there is a resource available for people to search the collection. This is a screenshot of part of it, the old library shelf list, um, which is searchable and is a good interim measure while I now begin the more detailed book cataloguing to international standards. I should say that all of the Mary Astle collection has been catalogued more fully now and is available to view on the university's online catalogue I discover. But in compiling this shelf list you see here, I decided to include provenance information of each book and whether there is marginalia in the books, as this is a very common inquiry librarians receive from researchers. And it was this research which led to the identification of Astle's books. It took me about five years to compile the whole old library shelf list alongside my other duties. So there was a very long research process associated with the identification of these books owned by Astle. Sorry about me in this picture, but, <laughs> um, but what does the Astle collection in Morden College look like? I have identified 42 volumes formerly owned by Astle. One of these volumes is quite different from the others. Um, it contains several short pamphlets concerning the English Reformation and the Church of England, and quite a few of these pamphlets are from the 16th century. Indeed, it might possibly have been owned previously by Astle's uncle Ralph. So in terms of separate items, there are 92 separate book titles I have identified but 47 of these are bound in one large volume of pamphlets. But considering the collection as a whole, 10 of these titles were definitely purchased by Astle, as shown by her handwritten dates of acquisition and the prices paid. Another 13 titles were gifts and bequests, where Astle notes the name of the person giving the gift, or there is an other evidence such as distinctive bindings identifying particular books as gifts. In another eight titles, Astle enters a date of acquisition only. It is likely that in the absence of any recognition of the items as gifts that these books were also purchased. 
The remaining 61 titles do not contain conclusive as evidence as to when or how they were acquired, but contain marginalia and notes identified as being in Astle's own hand. In terms of the languages represented in the collection, um, 69 of the titles are in English, 16 in French and seven in Latin. And uh, we can see here uh, the volumes for a better visualization of the collection. The first of Astle's books to be identified were the ones with the most obvious markings. Those books in which she had written her full name or initials which happens frequently when she received the book as a gift. The time period of the inscriptions and other names being mentioned in the inscriptions all certainly suggested that these books belonged to the Mary Astle, philosopher and author. This is one such example, the inscription M. Astle, April the 19th, 1709, the gift of the most ingenious and pious author. The author of this book is her colleague, John Norris, Astle's correspondent and mentor. So the date of receiving this book and the relationship between the two parties all confirms the provenance of this book really nicely. Here is another example, the inscription on the upper end paper, M. Astle, St. James's Day, 1723 part of the legacy left me by Mrs. E. Methuen, who died July the 4th, 1723. This is Elizabeth Methuen, Astle's friend and nearest neighbour to her home in Chelsea. So again, another very neat example of confirming the book's provenance, thanks to Astle's detailed inscription. The notes on this book about the geometry of the triangle give a hint to Astle's ability in mathematics and physics. And indeed, we know she studied with John Flamsteed, the Astronomer Royal, in 1697. And a third example here. M. Astle, February the 18th, 1709-10, the gift of the Right Honourable, the Lady Elizabeth Hastings. It is highly likely that Elizabeth Hastings selected this particular title as a gift for Astle because the translation of the book is the translator of the book is Elizabeth Elstob, a friend of Astle's and a prolific scholar of Anglo-Saxon. It also suggests that Astle could not afford to support Elstob by becoming a subscriber to the book herself. And indeed, Astle is not listed amongst the subscribers in the final pages, but Hastings is. Elizabeth Hastings was one of Astle's closest friends, and we know that she acted as a patron for her writing. But this example on the screen confirms that she also gave books as gifts. Having become familiar with Astle's writings, a circle of aristocratic women were keen to engage in intellectual exchanges with Astle and would receive books recommendations from her. Ruth Perry says um, of members of this circle, such as Lady Elizabeth Hastings and Lady Catherine Jones, that they took Astle under her, their wing due to her articulate presence and involvement in charitable activities. As we have seen, there are many books in Astle's collection which were given as gifts. Certainly it's not unusual to recommend, exchange and give books to friends. However, for Astle, books were an essential tool for her career in a way that was most unusual for an un unmarried woman of this period. Therefore, receiving books as gifts would have been a very helpful part of the support uh, that her friends offered her. These examples also show that Astle was not shy about writing on her books. We have seen that she does write her name on these books, but also that she writes supplementary notes. As a consequence of ident identifying these books, which were very clearly formerly owned by Mary Astle, I then went back to look at books in the old library, which I knew had a large amount of notes and marginalia on, and I could then compare the handwriting with known examples of Astle's. Once I had a good grasp of Astle's handwriting and note-taking styles, during a very short period of time, I could identify a lot of her books in the library. 
However, this rapid identification process was only possible due to the original work of recording provenance information for the online old library shelf list, as I described earlier. In order to confirm that I was on the right track with the marginalia I was identifying, I contacted Professor Ruth Perry, who was able to verify the handwriting as Astel's. And I hope she doesn't mind me saying that she was very excited about these findings. By finding more and more examples of Astel owned books in the library, I could then build up a very detailed picture of how Astel acquired and interacted with the books she owned. This book, Astel's copy of Nicolas Malabranche's De la Recherche de la Verité, is an example where Astel does not write her name on the book, but the handwriting is a match. And this work by Malabranche is also one which John Norris, in his correspondence to Astel, recommends that she reads. On the verso of the title page, we see lengthy notes by Astle about which editions of Malebranche's books she considered the best, including that the best edition of De la Recherche de la Verité is the fifth, printed in Paris by Michel David, which Astle says, in which many alterations and additions as I have inserted. This is the fourth edition, and in the back of the second volume, Astel includes a lengthy extract from the fifth edition, which she has copied out by hand. So she must have had access to the fifth edition, but either could not or would not purchase it. This is one of the very best examples of extra textual manuscript notes in the Astel collection. But she very often uses any blank space available for note taking and sometimes creating her own book index of the book in question. She uses brown ink, as we see here, and for the purposes of display, I've picked examples in pen, but she does very often use pencil too. One of the major questions to arise from this reconstruction of Astle's library is how the collection ended up at Maudlin. We know that Astel made a will as a single woman with belongings, and we know the name of Astel's executrix, Elizabeth Hutchison, a friend of Astel's. But unfortunately, no copy of the will survives. Some of Astel's books found their way into the Library of King's Cliff, Northamptonshire, in the village where Elizabeth Hutchison resided and can be seen here on the top left. The library books are now kept at Northamptonshire Record Office. However, the much larger grouping of books at Magdalen um, suggests that the college was the principal benefactor of her library collection. The only suggestion of a link between Magdalen and Astle is that Daniel Waterland, the master of the college between 1713 and 1740, who I mentioned earlier, was evidently a fan of Astle's. Um, and cited one of Astle's work in his book, Advice to a Young Student, and calls her an ingenious lady. During Astle's later years, Maudlin was in a period of active book collecting. Waterland, who was previously responsible for the logistics behind the donation of Bishop John Moore's library to Cambridge University, was well equipped to set up the Pepys Library when it arrived at Maudlin in 1724. According to the published college, college history, I quote, the arrival of the Pepys collection probably stimulated awareness of the poor state of the foundation library. The college was now the reasonably proud possessor of one of the world's great libraries, and it had been shamed into taking its own original humble library provision more seriously. It is certainly possible that Astle was aware of Pepys, um, Pepys's library arriving at Magdalen. The event was announced in contemporary newspapers, and Astle and Pepys had mutual acquaintances, such as Hans Sloane. Waterland was a popular master of Magdalen, and under his stewardship, a number of benefactions for scholarships was made to the college. So it is entirely possible that he would take an interest in brokering donations of books, especially from a figure with whom he shared academic and charitable interests, such as Mary Astle. He was also a client of Richard Wilkin, Astle's printer and bookseller. So you never know, they may have coincided at Wilkin's bookshop. 
The only contemporary or near contemporary evidence, I should say, of Astle's intention of bequeathing her books to Maudlin can be found at the Bodleian Library in the manuscripts of her biographer, George Ballard, the author of the book Memoirs of Several Ladies of Great Britain, published in 1752, in which Astle appears as the subject. In Ballard's draft manuscript for the book, he concludes his chapter on Astle by stating, she gave her library, which was a pretty large one, to Magdalen College in Oxford. Crucially, the in Oxford has been deleted, as one can see from the bottom of the image here, which is surely a result of Ballard finding no evidence of Astle's books in the library there. And this also happens to be his own college, so he knew it well. However, it is evidenced by Bas Ballard's deletion, but allowing the words Magdalen College to stand, that he was aware of Astle's library being at Magdalen College, Cambridge. The note in Ballard's manuscript reveals uh, that it was a deliberate decision of Astle's to leave her library to Magdalen College, Cambridge. Unfortunately, these details are not mentioned at all in the published version of Ballard's book which has surely contributed to the library being unidentified as Astle's beneficiary for nearly 300 years. Two of the Astle collection books bear the inscription, The Gift of Mrs Astle to Magdalen College, Cambridge. One we have seen here on the title page I showed earlier. The inscriptions are not in Astle's hand, nor in her usual brown ink, but in an 18th century hand using black ink, which appears in other books in the old library. It is likely, therefore, to be the hand of a person associated with the college, and further con confirms that it was an active choice by Astle to give her library to Magdalen College, Cambridge. Unfortunately, Astle does not appear in the old library's register of donors, a 17th century manuscript recording gifts of books, which unfortunately wasn't kept up for very long. And so Astle's donation would have come too late to be featured. The two women mentioned in this register are Frances Ray, the Countess of Warwick, daughter of Sir Christopher Ray, an alumni, alumnus of the college. Also mentioned is Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle, who gave her published works to the college, as she did with many other colleges in Cambridge. So to conclude, um, the Astor Collection at Magdalen College is an atypical and fascinating example of women's book collecting spanning the 17th and 18th centuries. It is highly unusual to find a female owned collection of books, which was used to inform the owner's published works. Astle was in the highly unusual position of being a female scholar and author living by her pen, and she benefited from enlightened family members who gave her an education and from friends and patrons who recognized her intellectual gifts. Some of the books in the Astor collection are very heavily annotated, but it is possible that there are completely unmarked books formerly owned by Astor, present in Magdalen's old library. The books which I have identified in the collection largely align with Astor's writing career and markedly drop off after 1709 when her charity school activities took over. Evidently, she did not have the means to buy books new, received books as gifts, and also borrowed and exchanged books, as we know from other documentary evidence. I have been able to present these findings due to professional librarianship work, um, namely the provenance survey conducted in preparation for cataloguing the old library's volumes to international standards. There was certainly good luck involved, but it is a good example of how there are still discoveries to be made in special collections libraries, which remain completely uncatalogued online. It is also the case that, um, speaking about Cambridge College libraries, that their rare books collections were catalogued online a number, a number of years ago, but provenance information was chosen not to be included to save time. 
So some libraries have come to regret this decision now that book ownership history and provenance is such a burgeoning area of scholarship. So I would strongly yeah. encourage universities to think about cataloguing by librarians as a scholarly activity which needs to be funded. I was fortunate that I was able to work on this as part of my day-to-day -day professional activities with full access to the collections. So whether the reassembly of Mary Astle's library would have happened in a traditional ac academic research context is difficult to say. I'm not an expert on academic funding, but it does seem unlikely that a research grant would have been awarded to survey the old library of Magdalen unless there was already a large amount of existing documentary evidence out there to suggest that Mary Astle's library had been donated. I'm very keen for the collection to be researched further by others, and I hope that from the examples I have given today, this will inspire academics in the field to use my research as a gateway for more detailed work into the Astle collection. My journal article has been scheduled for publication in September, but there has already been one exciting discovery made following on for my work. Professor Ruth Perry decided to take a look at electronic versions of the anonymous 18th century pamphlets in the Astor collection. Since this was all happening during COVID, when we were all heavily relying on electronic library resources. While having a read through this particular pamphlet online, an inquiry into the nature of the liberty of the subject, Perry immediately recognised the proto-feminist aspects of the text amongst many other characteristics, all strongly pointing towards Astle's authorship. Therefore, through the, the discovery of Astle's library, we have also been able to discover previously unidentified works by Astle herself. And the full findings of Perry's investigation of this pamphlet have been published in the journal 18th Century Studies. I'm really interested in seeing what other publications and projects appear as a result of this work. Indeed, I am already aware of some in the pipeline and the library has re received several inquiries already. Therefore, I hope that any outcomes of the identification of these books will embody a successful collaboration between special collections librarians and academic researchers. Uh, thank you very much.